So welcome back to um, Anatomy and Physiology. We're going to be starting 2.5, which is going to cover the digestive and the urinary systems. And um, so this one's the digestive system. So let's get started with this online review course. So the digestive system, the animal needs to provide nutrients and energies to the cells in their body. That's the whole purpose of eating is so that all the nutrients that we're ingesting can go and fuel the cells in our body to make energy. So one way that this is met is by breaking down and absorbing the nutrients that we're eating. And there's two different types of digestive systems. Um, and there's monogastrics, which is animals that have one stomach. And then there's ruminants, which are animals that have a four chambered stomach. So what is the point of the digestive tract and what does it do? So first of all, prehension, which is just grasping of food. And this happens, um, the beginning of your mouth is a part of the digestive system. And so your lips and your teeth are responsible for prehension. Mastication which happens in your mouth, the mechanical grinding and breakdown of food, which um, thanks to our teeth, that can happen. And then there's chemical digestion of food, which happens lower down into our GI, absorption of nutrients and water, and elimination of waste. So that's the very tip top of our GI tract all the way down to the bottom, that's what it does, all those five. So peristalsis is a very important aspect in regards to our digestive system because that's how the food moves from one into the other is by peristalsis, okay? So it's a circular muscle contraction that you can see in this picture here, and it creates this wave-like movement along the track. So it propels the digestive tract content, so whatever it is that you swallowed, along the tube ahead of them. So it just kind of pushes it down and pushes it down. So that's when you take a bite of pizza and you chew it and you swallow it, that's after after the swallowing part of it you have absolutely no control of that food and where it goes so thanks to peristalsis which is an involuntary muscle action um, the peristalsis will push it down your esophagus all the way down to your stomach and then from your stomach into the small intestine and so on and so forth so let's start with the very top of the digestive system and work our way back to um, the bottom of our digestive system so we're going to start with the oral cavity so the oral cavity or the buccal cavity, buccal is another word um, for oral. And um, so it consists of the lips, the tongue, the teeth, salivary glands, hard palate, soft palate, and the oropharynx. So lips play a role in prehension, like we had mentioned. The salivary glands, and, and they're located in the buccal cavity. They produce saliva. Um, and there's usually three pairs that have ducts that carry the saliva into our oral cavity. So we have a parotid salivary gland, and this is actually ventral to the ear canal, that's its location. Then we have a mandibular salivary gland, which is ventral to the parotid glands at the caudal angle of the mandible. So again, around the mandible, that's where, it, where it's at, hence its name. And the sublingual salivary gland, and just because of its name, I'm sure you can figure out where that one's located. The teeth, this is this picture here is a beautiful <laughs> picture of this guy has really beautiful teeth and um, they're responsible for mastication, so the chewing and the physical breakdown of food into smaller pieces so that we can swallow it. There's an upper arcade for our teeth, which is the upper teeth, which are um, contained within the maxilla. The maxilla is the upper jaw. And then we have a lower arcade of teeth and those are contained within the mandible, which is the lower jaw. There's a whole bunch of different types of tooth shape. Um, so carnivore teeth are more pointed on the occlusal surfaces. Now remember the word occlusal means um, the occlusal surface is just where your teeth come down into connection. So if you snap your teeth down where those upper and lower teeth touch and meet, that's the occlusal surface. And um, so it's more pointed at the occlusal surface and slightly curved uh, towards the back of the mouth. So this is really good for holding prey, tearing, cutting, and shredding, which is necessary for our carnivores. And then we have the herbivore teeth, which are f that have a flat occlusal surface, and this just helps them grind uh, plant and grain material. So this is a pretty cool picture here showing you the differences in the teeth. Um, starting all to the right over here with our carnivore teeth, you can imagine um, how that would be beneficial when grasping um, prey and tearing and cutting tissue. Then we have our omnivore, which kind of has the uh, carnivorous 
pointy teeth, um, but maybe not as dramatic as the carnivore. And then we have our herbivore here, which have those flat occlusal surfaces. And us humans, I guess we kind of fall somewhere in between herbivore and omnivore, really, um, although humans are omnivores. So um, there's different types of teeth as well. Um, the incisors are the front teeth that are located um, at the more rostral end of the jaw. And um, they're used for grasping. And uh, then we have a, and then we have our canine teeth, which you see a picture down here at the bottom. This one actually has a really cool, this guy went to a dental specialist, obviously. We don't see that very often in, in veterinary medicine because of the cost. Um, but this is a canine tooth here with a very cool um, metallic uh, cap, I guess you could call it. Um, and the canines are used for tearing, okay? That's what their job is to do, is to tear tissue located just laterally to the incisors. So if you take a look at that upper picture, you'll see the incisors at the top, and then just lateral to that, we'll find the canine. They're, the, they're longer than any other tooth, and they're pointed at the tip. The premolars are right behind the canines and they're cutting teeth. So they're rostral um, cheek teeth. Um, so the, the tooth, the teeth that are located uh, on your cheek, it's the rostral one, so closer down towards the nose. It has sharp points and surfaces in carnivores. Then we have our very back most caudal teeth and they are the molars and they are used for grinding. They're larger, flatter, um, than the others and uh, and use for grinding. So as far as terminology, when it comes to the buccal cavity or the oral cavity, we can use the term lingual. Um, specifically with dentition, we're talking about the inner surface of the lower arcade of the teeth. So lingual, anybody that has any kind of French um, in them, lingual, uh, if you think of la langue, langue means tongue. So long lingual is the inner surface of the lower arcade of the teeth. So that's, it's touching your tongue. Okay. Our palatal surface, which um, in regards to dentition, it's the inner surface of the upper arcade. So that's touching your palate, your upper palate, right? And that's what it's, um, that's why it's called palatal. We have labial, which is the outer surface of the upper and lower arcade at the front of the mouth. So labial um, is another labial lips. Okay. And um, so that's the surface that's touching your lips. And then the, we have a buccal surface in our oral cavity. Um, in regards to dentition, it's the outer surface of the teeth, more caudal in the mouth. So it's the ones that are facing the cheek. There's dental formulas, so it represents the typical number of each type of tooth found in the upper and the lower arcade of, of um, the mouth. So there's there's tooth type designated tooth type designated I for incisors. That's a weird phrase. Either way, in the dental formula, I is for incisors, C is for canine, P is for premolar, and M is for molar. So uppercase, you, you use these letters in uppercase when we're talking about adult teeth, but if we're talking about deciduous teeth or, or baby teeth, we use a lower arcade. The tooth type followed by two, so an I or a C or a P or an M, is then followed by two numbers. And it's separated by a slash mark or expressed as a fraction of one number over the other. So basically the first number is the number of teeth in half of the upper arcade. Okay, so we're talking about the upper arcade, so it's going to be half of it, so starting right in the medial aspect. And then the second number is going to be the number in the teeth in half of the lower arcade. So the, the first number, so we will have our letter, which is going to be I, C, P, or M, depending on the type of tooth we're talking about. And then after that, by one number, which is the upper arcade in half, the half of the upper arcade and then a slash and then what um, how many is in the lower arcade so the total number determined by summing all of the numbers and multiplied by two will give you the total amount of teeth i know this can get a, a little bit confusing without seeing the actual formula but this is what we're talking about here um, when we're talking about half 
of the arcade, so we're splitting it right here in half from right to left side. So this is I1, incisor 1, incisor 2, incisor 3, I3, okay? And then this would be C, and usually they would just, there would be a 1 there just to um, show you that there's just one canine. This is P1, P2, P3, P4, right? So premo the first premolar, second premolar, third premolar, fourth premolar, and M1 and M2. And that's what, that would be um, how we would write out the formula. This right here is going to show you how the formulas work. So uh, let's start with a puppy. And um, there's these are all lowercase, so a lowercase i, a lowercase c, and a lowercase p, because those are baby teeth. Those are deciduous teeth, OK? So i3 means that um, the upper arcade has three baby incisors. And then slash 3 means that there's three lower incisors. There's one upper canine and one lower canine. There's three premolars, upper premolars, and three lower premolars. But as that puppy turns into an adult, that's when we will start using uppercase because we're talking about adult teeth. The canine will have three upper incisors, three lower incisors. And remember, we're just talking about one side of the arcade. So this is just, um, this right here is just showing you, for example, the right side, obviously being identical on the on the left side. That's why we take all these numbers and then times them by two, because then we'll have the right and the left side. But this is just one side of the mouth. So on, let's say, the right side of the this adult canine, we're going to have three upper incisors, three lower incisors. And then on that same side, one canine and one canine, four premolars, and then two upper molars, but three lower molars. And that's what that means and then if you um, add, add those all up and then times it by two because we have a right and a left side right you'll have a total of 42 teeth in our canine and then you can see the differences between all these other species here So the structure of the tooth, um, there's different layers of a tooth. The pulp is the very, very center center of the tooth. And this is where blood and nerve supply enter. And so this is the pulp right here, right? The, right, the core center of the tooth. The apex is where the nerve and the nerves and blood supply comes into the tooth and, and fills the pulp, comes in at the apex right down here. Then we have uh, dentin, which is the next layer, okay, and the dentin surrounds and protects the tooth pulp. Dentin is actually sensitive. There are nerve endings that go into the dentin. So once dentin is exposed, it can be very painful. And then um, there is something down here, down at the root surface called cementum. And it's not labeled on here, but um, you can see that my, my red dot is following it there. And that's the cementum. And it's a hard connective tissue and it covers the tooth root so underneath the bottom half of the tooth, and it helps fasten the tooth securely into the bone of the jaw. Then we have the enamel, which is the outer covering of the crown part of the tooth. So the crown is the exposed part of the tooth, and it's the hardest, toughest tissue in the body. Gingiva um, is the gums. And it's epithelial tissue that uh, composes the gums around the tooth. And you can see the gingiva right here, which is the, pinks, the pink substance here. And it's actually epithelial tissue. This here is showing you um, those layers of the tooth starting from the outside. So this, this part here is the crown. And then if we go under the gum, this is the root. So we have our enamel, which is the hard outer surface, and then the next layer underneath the enamel is going to be the dentin. The dentin, the, the enamel is only in the crown of the tooth, but the dentin, the next layer, goes all the way through the entire tooth, root and crown. And, um, and then the very, very center core is the pulp where all the blood and nerve vessels are, and then it leaves the apex of the tooth, which is right down here. This picture is also showing you the cementum, which is right here outside of the dentin, and it cements it down. Um, there's also going to be a, a periodontal ligament, which is going to help that tooth stay into place as well. And then we have our alveolar bone here, which is our jawbone.
So the function of our oral cavity, we, we talked about, it's for prehension. It also initiates mastication, so mechanical digestion. We're going to talk about mechanical digestion and chemical di digestion. Mechanical digestion is, um, is the mastication aspect of it. It's the actual mechanical action of breaking down the food. Um, breaks food into smaller particles. That increases the surface area available for exposure to the enzymes involved in chemical digestion. So basically, mechanical digestion happens so that we can break it down to little tiny particles particles so that chemical digestion can do its job. Um, it also initiates chemical digestion and that happens with saliva. So in the oral cavity, not only do we have mechanical digestion that starts, but chemical digestion starts here as well, thanks to the saliva. The saliva is added to food as it's chewed and it moistens, softens, and shapes food into a form that is more readily swallowed. And, um, and the oral cavity will also help prepare food for swallowing. So the digestive enzymes that we were talking about, the, the chemical um, digestion that happens in the mouth, and um, the autonomic nervous system controls most of the glands in the digestive system. So the parasympathetic stimulation increases salivation. So this is um, anticipation of eating can cause the parasympathetic stimulation of the salivation salivary glands. So um, if I think, oh my gosh, look at that pizza, I'm going to eat it. It's so yummy looking. Automatically, my parasympathetic nervous system is going to stimulate those um, salivary glands to start expressing saliva. The sympathetic nervous system, though, um, actually decreases salivation. So when we go into our fight or flight, um, Again, I'm going to refer to that dinosaur busting into my room. My sympathetic nervous system is going to kick in. And the last thing my body is going to be worried about is creating saliva so that I can eat and chew this pizza. My body is more concerned about getting blood to my heart and to my muscles so that I can get the heck out of here away from this dinosaur. So sympathetic nervous system actually decreases salivation. But then once I realize, oh, no, I'm just hallucinating and my parasympathetic nervous system kicks back in and everything kind of calms down and my body goes back to homeostasis, um, it will uh, bring back that normal salivation into my oral cavity. This, uh, so that was our oral cavity. We're going to move down to further down into our digestive tract to the upper GI. So starting with the esophagus, the esophagus is, um, is a tube that um, starts in your pharynx. And um, remember, there's two tubes in your pharynx. There's one tube, which is your trachea, that leads to your respiratory system. The other tube is your esophagus. Remember that your trachea in quadrupeds um, lies ventral and in your pharynx, and then the esophagus lies um, dorsal. Okay, so that's in quadrupeds. So you have to think of an animal on all four. So the trachea is going to be ventral, the esophagus is going to be dorsal. So the esophagus transports swallowed material from the pharynx to the stomach. It enters the stomach at an angle in the cardia region, which is a part of the stomach, and we're going to talk about that in a second. And um, it is going to pass through a sphincter once it leaves the esophagus and moves its way into the stomach, and that's called the cardiac sphincter. So it opens and allows food to come into the stomach. As the stomach expands, Expands, the fold of the stomach um, against the esophagus closes the lower end of the esophagus. So this reduces the risk of reflux, so everything in the stomach stays in the stomach, or hopefully it does. In some species, the closure is so strong that it actually will not allow reflux or vomiting at all. So like rabbits and horses, this um, cardiac sphincter cannot ever open. They do not vomit, um, whereas other animals, they're in some cases, vomiting can happen, which allows the food to go from the stomach back through the cardiac sphincter and out the esophagus. So um, moving down to the stomach, and we're going to talk about monogastric stomachs. First, there's five different areas in this one stomach. We have our cardia, which is the very uh, entrance of our stomach. We have the fundus, which you can see in this picture here, um, the body of the stomach, the pyloric antrum, as well as the pylorus. The cardia, which is the opening from the esophagus, uh, hence the name cardiac sphincter that allows it into the cardia. After that, the fundus which is the second part of the stomach, is a distensible blind pouch. So it expands as more food is swallowed. So basically that's the expansion part of our stomach as we eat that pizza. And then the body of the stomach is a distensible middle section of the stomach. The fundus and the body contain numerous glands. 
Um, these gastric glands contain parietal cells, which produce hydrochloric acid, which is the stomach acid that's going to help chew up that food. There's chief cells, which produce the enzyme pepsinogen. And then there's mucus cells, which produce the productive mucus that lines the stomach so that the stomach acid doesn't eat the stomach wall. Okay. The pyloric antrum is the next step in the stomach, and this grinds up swallowed food, okay, and regulates hydrochloric acid. So glands contain, the glands in the pyloric antrum contain what's called G cells, and they secrete gastrin, um, increases production of hydrochloric acid, and inhibits muscle activity of the fundus. So this all happens here. And, um, and then finally, the pylorus, which is a muscular sphincter, the pyloric antrum leads to the pyloric sphincter and it regulates the movement of chyme because up uh, all the way up to the pyloric antrum the food that was swallowed it, it gets turned into this bolus that's ready to move down to the to the small intestine and that bolus of churned and partially digested and grind it's actually not digested uh, broken down it's actually causes it creates a bolus that's actually called chyme and it moves from the stomach into the duodenum and it passes the pyloric sphincter and it prevents backflow of duodenal content into the stomach so we have our cardiac sphincter at the beginning of our stomach and then the pyloric or the pylorus the pyloric sphincter at the the base of the stomach that um, stops makes things go from the stomach into the duodenum which is the beginning of the small intestine and, and stops prevents backflow as well so gastric motility, each area of the stomach has a different motor function. The fundus and the body relax with the swallowing of food. The body of the stomach contracts to help mix the food. The pyloric antrum increases contractions in response to swallowing. So it stimulates mixing, grinding, and propulsive contractions that move food towards the pylorus, okay, to get it out of the stomach. Peristalsis also occurs in the stomach and the intestines as well, like we discussed that it happens in the esophagus. This here is showing you gastric motility and um, how we're going to have the body of the stomach contract, move things down into the pyloric antrum, and it moves in like a wave-like uh, fashion. Um, yeah, and there's going to be grinding that happens in the pyloric antrum, and you can see that at step number two. And, um, and then in the last step here, you can see the pyloric, the pyloric sphincter opening up and allowing that chyme that that grinded up food to finally move into the duodenum so um stomach contains mucosal layers okay so there's different layers to the stomach there's a submucosa a muscular layer which has longitudinal and circular muscle fibers and then an outer serosal layer smooth muscle in the stomach wall responds to hormones um, like peptides of the nervous system controls. So the parasympathetic stimulation causes the fundus to relax and increase contraction of the antrum, whereas the sympathetic stimulation can cause a decrease in motility altogether. Okay, so again, my stomach's not worried about digesting that pizza as I'm being chased by the dinosaur. He's more, my, my body's more concerned about getting my heart pumping and, mus and blood to my musculature so I can run. So for ruminants, there is one true stomach and three four stomachs. So um, some people say that it's four stomachs. Some people say it's just one stomach with four chambers. But again, none, nonetheless, there's four compartments. One of them is considered the true stomach. So it has similar functions of the monogastric stomach and then three four stomachs. So the ruminants swallow their food, regurgitate it. So bring it back up, chew it a second time, and then swallow it again. And that whole process is called rumination. So the four parts of the ruminant stomach, we have the rumen, the reticulum, the omasum, and the abomasum. And the abomasum, which is the very last compartment, is actually what we consider the true stomach. So it has very similar functions as that monogastric stomach. This right here will show you um, the ruminant stomach all laid out, so you can obviously empty. And uh, you can see the rumen and the reticulum and the omasum. Um, and the abomasum. The reticulum. 
which is the smaller, smallest, most cranial compartment of the four stomach compartments. Okay, so it's the smallest one. It separates. It's separated from the rumen by the ruminoreticular fold. So there's only a fold that separates the rumen from the reticulum. Lining is composed of these honeycomb arrangement folds, which is really cool. You'll see a picture in a second. And the reticulum in the rumen um, has a coordinated contraction, and the food actually mixes between these two compartments. This here is a really cool picture of the inside of a reticulum, and it, and it has that honeycomb kind of look to it. The rumen, which is the largest compartment, a series of muscular sacs partially separated from one another by long muscular folds of the rumen wall called pillars. Pillars aid in the mixing and stirring of the ruminal content, so that those, those muscular folds will help the mixing and the stirring of whatever it is that that um, animal ate. The reticulo, uh, the reticulo ruminal contractions, so with the reticulum in the rumen, allow partially digested plant food to be regurgitated during rumination and allows buildup carbon dioxide or methane gas to be expelled from the rumen. Rumen motility is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system, so the rate and strength of contraction is determined by rumen pH. The presence of volatile acids, fatty acids, consistency of the ingesta in the rumen, stretch receptors, and feedback from the brainstem and other parts of the GI system. This here shows you um, the lining of the rumen, which is much different than the um, reticulum. Now the omasum and the abomasum, the reticulo, the reticulo rumen contractions move the ingesta from the reticulum in the rumen and move it into the omasum. The muscular, this muscular organ um, has many muscular folds. It breaks down food particles down, it breaks it down even further, and it absorbs the remaining volatile fatty acids that were not absorbed in the rumen or the reticulum. This is where the those volatile fatty acids will be absorbed in the omasum and um, removes bicarbonate ions and absorbs some water from the ingesta. After that, it's going to move to the abomasum, which is the very last stomach called the true stomach, and this functions the same as the monogastric stomach. This here um, shows you the lining of the omasum, and this here is showing you the lining of the abomasum, which looks very similar to the stomach folds within a monogastric. So, um, newborn ruminant digestion, new, newborn ruminant digestive tract functions primarily as a monogastric digestive system. So that's very interesting. So a newborn calf is actually going to digest similar to a monogastric. Um, rumen and reticulum are completely non-functional at birth. So the rate of development of the rumen and the reticulum are affected by the diet. So milk versus grain. Um, reticular grooves um, or esophageal grooves in the wall of the reticulum conveys liquid from the esophagus directly to the omasum. So um, moving on to the, um, continuing on with the lower GI, we're going to be talking about intestines. So the small intestine is made up of three different parts. The first one being the duodenum, and it's the first short segment that leaves the stomach. Okay, so it, it's well, basically the duodenum starts at this, the pyloric sphincter, right, at the end of the stomach, and makes its way to the second part of the small intestine, which is called the jejunum. And this is the longest portion of the small intestine. And then that will lead into the final um, section of the small intestine called the ileum. And um, the ileum is separated from the colon by an ileocecal sphincter. Okay, so this is where the cecum is going to be. But uh, right at the end of the ileum, we're going to have that sphincter that's going to lead into the large intestine. And it regulates movement of the material from the small intestine into the colon or the cecum. This here is showing you the three different aspects. So we have the top, um, we have our stomach here. Uh, this is a pyloric sphincter or pylorus that leads into the beginning of our small intestine, which is our duodenum. You can see that it's short. And then right here, it'll just transition into the jejunum, which is the longest part of the small intestine, which then it will right here transfer into the ileum, which will then, um, this is the ileocecal sphincter here that leads into the cecum and the large intestine. 
So the intermucosal layer, there's an it, so the small intestine has an intermucosal layer, a submucosal layer, a muscular layer, and an outer serosal layer. So there's four different layers of our small intestine. Relative thickness of these layers differ in each segment of the intestine. Uh, the parasympathetic stimulation involved in small intestine. Uh, in small intestinal motility, secretion, and, and blood flow. So thanks to our parasympathetic nervous system, we have that motility, secretion, and blood flow. Our sympathetic um, uh, nervous system actually decreases blood flow. Again, we're not worried about digesting that pizza. When our sympathetic fight or flight kicks in, uh, the blood is going to go somewhere else. Therefore, motility, secretion, and blood flow is going to slow down in the small in intestine. Although this is stating right here that it has very little effect on motility. So as far as secretion and blood flow um, will still happen, but motility um, has very little effect. So I guess that's why you still poop your pants when you're being chased by a dinosaur. The motility in your intestines doesn't um, have any effect. This right here shows you the different layers, the four different layers of our small intestine. You can see the more inner, inner one is the mucosa, the submucosa right underneath that mucosa. We have our muscular layer, which helps with the peristalsis and the movement, and then the serosal layer, which is on the outside. So the mucosa itself, so the very most, um, the innermost uh, part of our small intestine has many folds and villi. So this is a villi here that you see in this picture. So they're like finger-like protrusions that come up off, uh, off of the mucosa. Each villus contains thousands of microvilli brush borders. So this is one villus and it has a whole bunch, like hundreds of these little tiny little th thousands probably of microvilli on the surface of it. And and um, the microvilli, um, digestive enzymes and carrier molecules are embedded in the cell membrane. There's um, within these villi, there's crypts, which are invaginations of the mucosa around each villus. So each one of these big finger-like protrusions in between those, is, those are, that's, that area is called a crypt and produce cells that are pushed from the bottom of the crib up to the villus to replace older cells shed at the tip of the villus. There's also goblet cells within here um, that produce mucus and they help protect the intestinal mucosa. This right here is a picture showing you one villus and all of its um, uh, microvilli. So um, you can see that depicted there. This right here is a very cool picture of um, an inte the intestinal villi. So it's all these whole bunch of um, finger-like protrusions that have thousands of microvilli. And each one of the, it just increases the surface area of our small intestine so that absorption can take place. So peristalsis of the small intestine, it's associated with the coordinated contraction of a longitudinal and circular muscle layer. So it's stimulated by reflexes in response to the dilation of the segment of the bowel. So, um, so once that small intestine stretches to a certain point, it, it's going to stimulate that, um, that contraction. Independent of the parasympathetic nervous system, so I guess that makes sense why motility wasn't really affected by the sympathetic nervous system, because it's not really controlled by the, um, the nervous system at all. Cholecystokinin, we're going to be talking about this um, uh, this, I guess you would call it a hormone or a chemical, and prostaglandins may also stimulate intestinal motility. So um, those two are involved with the motility that you have in your intestines. There's segmental contractions, which mix intestinal contents. It's a slow movement through the intestines. It helps mix digestive enzymes with the intestinal content. So it kind of has this churning effect and it helps mix all these digestive enzymes that our body's putting into our small intestine and also with the food that was put into it. So it brings digested material into contact with the surface of the intestinal tract for absorption. And this picture here is showing you the segmentation in the small intestine. And the purpose of segmentation is to mix and churn, not to move material along as in peristalsis. So this specific contraction is to help churn and break down that food so that it can be um, mixed with the digestive enzymes and then properly absorbed. 
So small intestine digestion. So electrolytes, water, and vitamins are absorbed intact across the small intestine, intestinal wall. Carbohydrates, protein, and fats are actually chemically digested, okay? So electrolytes, water, and vitamins are just, just diffused right through the wall and go into our body, except for carbs, proteins, and fats have to be broken down chemically. Now, chemical digestion involves enzymes in the lumen of the intestine, as well as enzymes associated with the microvilli. Let's talk about carbohydrate digestion. So starch, one of the three main types of carbs, is converted into a disaccharide. Okay, so this is like sugar in the lumen of the duodenum by pancreatic amylase. So the pancreas is going to dump amylase, which is a digestive enzyme, into the duodenum. And its job is to take the starch and convert it into a disaccharide, which is a sugar. Disaccharides are further digested by the enzymes in the cell membrane of the microvilli. The resulting monosaccharide, so a simple sugar, is transported across the microvilli um, cell membrane and absorbed into the blood, and that's when our body's going to use it. Protein digestion. So gastric pepsin, which is in the stomach, breaks apart some of the protein chains into smaller polypeptides, so that happens in the stomach. So it turns it into polypeptides. There's five pancreatic proteases, so trypsin, chemotrypsin, elastase, aminopepsidase, and carboxypepsidase, or pep, pep, yeah, pepsidase. Um, these are five different types of um, uh, chemical digestive enzymes that are produced by the pancreas. And um, they will partially digest the peptides. Um, partially digest the peptides, further um, digested by the pepsidases in the microvilli. So similar to the carbohydrates, remember it was brought into a disaccharide and then further digested in the microvilli into a monosaccharide. Well, the protein digestion happens the same way and it's further broken down into the microvilli. And then um, amino acids, dipeptides, and some tripeptides are then absorbed across the cell membrane and brought into the blood. And those amino acids and dipeptides and tripeptides peptides are then going to be utilized by the body. So whenever we're talking about amino acids in the body, that's where it comes from. We eat a protein, it gets broken down and broken down and broken down all the way into amino acids, which is what makes its way into our blood system to be utilized. We, um, and then fat digestion. So agitation of the pyloric antrum in the stomach breaks fat globules or triglycerides into small droplets. And then uh, bile acids, which um, th that bile acid is dumped into the duodenum thanks to our liver and gallbladder. So that bile acid will then coat those little tiny fat droplets. And um, also the pancreatic lipases penetrate bile acid coating. So um, the pancreas, again, will spit out uh, lipase which is a digestive enzyme, and it'll penetrate that bile acid that coated that fat droplet, and it'll digest the fat molecules to produce glycerol fatty acids and monoglycerides, um, droplet fragments into smaller particles. So, and those smaller um, droplets, those smaller particles of fat are called min cells, and those min cells, again, go through the microvilli and make their way to our blood system, and that's how fat is digested and brought into our circulating blood. Moving down into our, our large intestine, which is the final stop of our gastrointestinal tract. So there's three different components, if you will. There's the cecum, which is a blind sac at the ileocecal junction. The ileocecal junction is just where the ileum ends and the cecum starts. And it's often referred to as a blind sac. Um, the cecum in carnivores, uh, are very small and as well as omnivores, but in herbivores, the cecum is much, much larger. So in horses and rabbits, you'll have a very large cecum. Um, the second component would be the colon, which has some microbial digestion that happens here. And then the very last stop of our digestive tract or our large intestine, sorry, is the rectum. So there are species variations in the structure of our large in, of the large intestines. The primary function of the large intestine is to recover fluid and electrolytes, and it also stores feces until it can be eliminated or pooped out. So um, nutrients 
absorption happens in the small intestine and in, in the large intestine, it's mainly uh, water absorption and storage of feces until it can pass on. So carnivores, when we're talking about differences, species variations with large intestines, the carnivores have a simple tubular colon. It's uh, in a very poorly developed cecum, like I said. But in non-ruminant herbivores, for example, um, the rabbit and the horse, they have very large colons and cecums, which are often referred to as a hind gut. And this is actually where fermentation happens. Now, Speaking of hindgut digestion in um, horses, guinea pigs, rabbits, and rats, so these are all uh, monogastric herbivores. The modification of the cecum and the colon allow for fermentative digestion in the hindgut. So this is what happens, and, and I, I keep saying in monogastrics herbivores, and that's because in the rumen, in, in ruminants, that fermentation happens in the rumen, which is, remember that first, the, the very large compartment of the four stomachs, the rumen, fermentation happens there. But if we have a monogastric, um, that fermentation is going to happen in the cecum or in the hind gut. So volatile, volatile fatty acids produced um, by microbes are absorbed from the cecum and colon for energy needs, just like they are from the rumen in ruminants. So when we're talking about fermentation, fermentative digestion, that's what we're talking about is volatile fatty acids are going to be absorbed and used as energy. Acids buffer, buffered by the secretion of bicarbonate directly into the colon and the cecum. So it can be quite acidic, right? And um, it, But it's buffered by bicarbonate that's, um, that's put into the cecum. Now the rectum is the terminal portion of the large intestine. The nervous system control of motility and secretion is similar to that of the colon. So numerous uh, mucus secreting glands lubricate and aid the passage of the contents. Um, and sensory receptors detect stretching and stimulate the defecate, defecation response. So um, animals don't typically feel the need to defecate until their colon has stretched to the point where these sensory receptors are saying, okay, we're stretched enough, let's, um, let's get rid of this. And then you'll have that defecation sensation. The anus is the um, sphincter at the very end of the rectum. So the exit portion. And it's actually, the anus is actually made up of an internal and external, external muscular sphincter. The internal sphincter is under autonomic control. So we have no control over the internal sphincter. Um, but the external sphincter, thank God, is under voluntary control. So we can control that external sphincter. So as the rectum distends, those stretch receptors are um, in the rectum wall causes partial relaxation of the internal sphincter and that's what we mean by autonomic control so remember the the rectum is going to stretch our our nervous system or the stretch receptors are going to say okay we're, we need to defecate so it's going to give that sense of defecation and then we're going to have partial relaxation of that internal sphincter and that's under autonomic control we don't control that but thankfully we can control the external sphincter and um and then um, and that's under um, our voluntary control. Anal mucosal receptors increase the sense and need for defecation. So we're going to talk, we talked about the gastrointestinal tract, so literally from the oral cavity down to the anus, but there's also accessory digestive organs. So there's organs in our body that aid in digestion, and we're going to talk about those. So first of all, let's talk about the liver and what it does for our digestion. The liver produces bile, which is made up of bile, acids, cholesterol, and bilirubin. Secreted, um, this bile is secreted into bile ducts or um, to hepatic ducts and then to the gallbladder. And it just hangs out in the gallbladder until it's needed. So stimulation of the cholecystokinin that we talked about causes the gallbladder to contract and this forces bile down the common bile duct into the duodenum. So it dumps into the duodenum. And remember that bile is involved in fat digestion, right? It, it hugs those fat molecules that comes out of the stomach. So it, um, it removes toxins, infectious agents, etc., that enter the body through the wall of the GI tract. Um, also, um, 
I'm sorry, we're not talking about um, the bile anymore. We're back to the liver. The liver removes toxins, toxins infection, if infectious agents um, that enter the body through the GI, GI wall. And also the liver stores or metabolizes nutrients absorbed from the GI tract. Moving on to the pancreas, the production of pancreatic amylase, protease, and lipase. These are... Um, uh, enzymes produced by the pancreas that will aid in digestion. Secretes bicarbonate into the duodenum, so it helps neutralize the acidity of its content. So um, remember, there's that stomach acid that's being produced, and if that comes down into our duodenum, it could chew right, that acid could just chew right through the duodenum, right? Because the duodenum doesn't have that mucus layer like the stomach does to protect it, but the pancreas will secrete bicarbonate into the duodenum, and this is going to help neutralize that acidity and maintain the pH in the duodenum. And um, the pancreas also produces insulin and glucagon, which helps regulate blood glucose levels. So again, that's not a digestive function, but nonetheless, that is a function of the pancreas.